Volcanoes. The island of Sumatra has a few dramatic stratovolcanoes, classic cones reaching up thousands of metres above their surroundings and representing devastating hazards to the local populations. While they can be destructive to life and societies, volcanoes and their igneous roots are the stuff of continents, factories of new crust. These are the volcanoes we've just seen, erupting in the past decade, but they're not alone. All these have been active in the past 10,000 years, and these in the last couple of million. And they follow the tectonic boundary that defines the edge of the Eurasian plate. How does this all work? Why are the volcanoes in narrow tracks? What are the tectonic controls? Sumatra is a great place to answer these questions. The volcanic arc broadly lies parallel off to the side of the ocean trench that is the plate boundary. So let's look at a simplified profile with the Indian Ocean off to the left and Sumatra with its volcanoes in the middle, the Malay Peninsula to the right. So what's happening down below in the mantle to form volcanoes at the surface? Well, Let's leave the volcanoes for a minute. We need to understand the plate boundary and earthquakes are the way. So these are a couple of decades worth of earthquakes, colour coded for depth in the earth. Let's strip away the shallow ones, the ones in purple, and there's a striking pattern. The earthquakes are in bands, getting deeper from blue to green to yellow, even red, towards the northeast. That's under the island of Sumatra. And here are the volcanoes, and they lie along the green-yellow boundary, where earthquake hypercentres lie around 150 kilometres below the Earth's surface. So let's add this to our profile. The earthquakes define the subduction zone, where the floor of the Indian Ocean is taken down deeper and deeper beneath Sumatra. So the volcanoes at the surface are over the place where the subducted slab reaches the depth of around 150 kilometres. The separation between trench and volcanic arc at the Earth's surface is called the arc trench gap and it's controlled by the dip how steeply the slab descends into the mantle. So why is melt generated here then to rise to erupt at the Earth's surface? If we're geochemists we can analyse the volcanic rocks, the ash and lavas, to try to identify a possible source. But the catch with these materials is that they've come up through the continental crust and been contaminated by it, which means that identifying the source has become something of a controversy in igneous geochemistry. Is it the mantle wedge above the subducted slab that melts, or is it the subducted slab itself? It's a question that's rumbled on through the decades and may well not have a single answer. So let's ask a simpler one. How could you melt the mantle? Well, one way to melt things is to heat them up. So what's the temperature structure of subducted slabs? Away from slabs, of course, the Earth's temperature obviously increases downwards, cold rocks at the surface. So, as subduction takes these near-surface rocks, the slab of oceanic plate, down, it's bringing cold rocks to depth. Rocks have great thermal inertia, they retain their temperature, so subduction zones are colder, much colder, than the surrounding mantle. These are a set of calculated models that forecast the thermal structure in and around the subduction zone. Regardless of the scenario, the slab is always colder. OK, it's warming up as it's getting subducted, but in these models it never gets warm enough to melt. So, another way mantle can melt is by decompression. It's how oceanic crust forms at mid-ocean ridges. But of course, the slab is going deeper. That's the opposite of decompression. So, decompression isn't going to work for us. So, what else can we do? Well, add fluid to the mantle wedge. Water drastically reduces the solidus of mantle rocks. And of course, the slab was once ocean floor, 
so it could have plenty of water in it. But it needs to be released at around 150 kilometres down to generate the magma to feed up to the volcanoes. So what are the water resources available from the slab? This is a cartoon of the fundamental components of oceanic plates. One scenario we'll see plays out is hydrated mantle that's altered due to hydrothermal activity at mid-ocean ridges soon after the plate was formed. These hydrated mantle rocks are called serpentinites. Now, on top of the plate, sediments of course have lots of water in to start with, but this is quickly lost in the first few kilometres by burial, leaving compacted sedimentary rocks. The next release of fluid, though, is through metamorphism, essentially creating minerals with low water content, so dehydration. But much of this is going to happen at depths significantly shallower than 100 kilometres down the subduction zone. Which gets us back to the mantle and its serpentinites. These can contain up to 15% water and form layers many kilometres thick. And at temperatures in excess of around 450 degrees centigrade, the serpentinites dehydrate much going back to make anhydrous olivine. And that dehydration can flush water up into the overlying mantle wedge. The key question for dehydration of the serpentinite then is where down the subduction zone does that slab hit 450 degrees centigrade? In models like this, there are lots of possible variables. The initial temperature of the slab, its rate of subduction, and for melting the overlying mantle, we need to know the temperature structure of that mantle wedge. These models are generic and not made for Sumatra, but they serve to illustrate the problem. It's quite surprising that, given all these variables, volcanic arcs have rather simple distributions along plate boundaries. And there are a few places in the world where strange volcanic rocks are thought to come from melts of the slab itself but these are very rare. All of which means that this is the generally accepted explanation of volcanic arcs, water driven off the slab from dehydration reactions that flush into the mantle wedge above and the magma rises, interacting with the overlying crust and some erupts to form volcanoes. In doing this, the volume of the crust has been increased, added to by material derived from the mantle or the oceanic plate. So these are factories of the continental crust. The magma generation makes for dramatic volcanic arcs and some especially large and explosive volcanic eruptions. And it's on this crust, much of it very much older than Sumatra, that we live. <laughs>